bless you. Well, good evening, everybody. Yes. Um, we're going to do a little something different for next week. There you go. This is a homework assignment. No, you can't work on it now. Okay. But uh, if you want to, uh, you don't have to take one of these, but it'll help you to be prepared for next week if you want to take one and look it up, the scriptures up. Uh, open your Bible tonight to Exodus chapter 30. I have to go back on what I told you last week. I said we'd be inside the tabernacle, but we're not going to be in it yet. Um, there's so much stuff in this tabernacle. There's so many beautiful pictures, and, and um, it's just amazing to me when people say that they read the Bible and get nothing out of it, or else they say that the Bible is just a book. But when you get into the Word of God and begin to study it, I mean, even in the Old Testament, especially in the Old Testament, you, you see you see how God's put it all together, and it, and it all works, and it all, it's all just meshes together. And, and, and the picture tonight that I want you to see, that God wants you to see, I think is very interesting. It's the second piece of furniture in the, uh, in the tabernacle courtyard. There were two on, in the outer court, and then the rest of them were all inside the, the uh, tabernacle tent itself. The first piece of furniture was... The altar, the brazen altar, the, the bronze altar in the front. And that was for the purpose of offering sacrifices to deal with sin. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate that. And Jeff, too. Um, and right behind it, uh, if you have your little folders, you can see the, you, the pictures there. Um, right behind it was uh, the, the brazen laver or bronze basin. And this is what we're going to look at here tonight in uh, Exodus chapter 30. We'll begin reading in verse number 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thou shalt also make a laver, or a basin of brass, and his foot also of brass, this was the base, to wash withal, and thou shalt put it between the tabernacle of the congregation and the altar. And thou shalt put water therein, and Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet through, uh, thereat. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water, that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offerings made by fire unto the Lord, so shall they wash their hands and their feet, that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. There's a couple of things that I want you to see here that are not mentioned to us, that they don't tell us about. And they do tell us about on the other pieces of furniture. Number one, they don't tell us what size it is. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it doesn't say anything about the dimensions. All we know is it was a basin, and, uh, it, and it was uh, very large, um, and it held water, and the water was for the purpose of purification, cleansing, and we'll talk about the meaning of it just in a second. It doesn't tell us how they moved it. If you see the other pieces of furniture as we go through, we've already talked about the altar. The altar had rings on the side. It had poles through it, <clears throat> and there was a process to how to move it from one place to the other. Because as uh, Brother Wayne mentioned to us here not long ago, <clears throat> according to him, the, the tabernacle was moved 42 times. So all of this had to be packed up and moved. And we don't know how this, this labor was moved. We don't know how big it is. We don't know anything about it except that it was made out of bronze or brass. And uh, there's a little interesting uh, point to it that we'll get to in just a second that I want you to see. But the purpose of this basin was for cleansing. And uh, we'll see how important that is. The issue of purity was super important to God and to the worship of God. Um, God cared how they came. Guess what? He cares how you came. You came tonight too. 
He cares how we come to his house. I think one of the things that I see in the modern church today is that there is too much casualness about coming to God. Um, I understand that times have changed and people have changed, but God hasn't changed. And uh, God cares that our attitude is one of honor and respect and that we understand that He is a God of purity. And so purity is very, very important to God. So this is why this labor is there, but there's something very, very interesting about it. The tabernacle was a testimony that God was willing to meet with people who were striving for purity and holiness. Were they pure and holy? Yes or no? It's a very simple answer. No. Why weren't they? Because they were human and sinners. So God had to make a way to deal with the sin issue and the impurity issue, the unholiness of people. Because see, even though their sin was covered by the offering, they still sinned. Anybody here not sin? Anybody willing to raise your hand and say you don't sin? Because we know you, right? So this is the issue that God has been dealing with with his people. He makes a way for them to have a right standing with him. But the truth of the matter is we still walk in this world. And we still have to deal with the, the ramifications of sin in our life and the, and the presence of sin. So this is God's way. This tabernacle is a way for God to work out this relationship so that He wants to be a part of people's lives who are not yet pure and, and holy. So what's the first thing the worshiper had to do when they wanted to worship God? What's the first thing? We've talked about this already. They had to come where? They had to come to the, to the, the courtyard. And how did they get in? Could they just climb over the wall? One gate. They had to come in one gate, a prescribed gate that God prepared. And it was the gate was on the east and they came in from the east to the west, which indicated that they were approaching God. When they came in the gate, what did they have to bring? A sacrifice. And they had to offer that sacrifice first and foremost. Before anything else happened, they had to bring an offering for, for sin. They had to deal with the sin question. This is what the altar was for. The altar, the burnt offerings and the altar was for dealing with sin, the, the big sin question. Because oftentimes we don't think about it, but there is two parts to this. There is the sin issue, S-I-N, and then there are sins, plural. The sin issue is the nature that we have. The S-I-N-S are the results of the sin nature, or the actions or the carrying out of that sin nature and that power. Paul says, he says, that, he said, I have two, two things going on inside of me. He said, I have a desire to, to please God, but I also have this nature inside of me. And he said, the things I know I should do, I don't do. And the things I know I shouldn't do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? It's Romans 7. And the answer is the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God. And we're going to see how that works together here. So they come, and um, this, this basin was there, and the priest would do, use it two th for two things. He would use it, first of all, when he made an offering on the altar, because even though the animals were as perfect as they could be without blemish and spot, what happens to an animal that's out in the pasture? It gets dirty. And so when the priest would be handling these animals and, and the different sacrifices, his hands would get dirty. And so before he would offer a sacrifice, he would go to the brazen 
the, the, the basin, and he would wash. And then after he would sacrifice, he would wash. Because what happened after he offered the animal? What was he? He was dirty, and he was probably bloody, too. I mean, you guys that have hunted and gutted a deer out in the field, and you know, you know what that looks like. And, uh, and so the picture here, the picture that God wants you to see and me to see is this. The blood takes care of our sin question, the penalty of sin. The basin takes care of the contamination of sin on a daily basis. And we'll see how that works out here as we go through there. So he had to uh, wash. Um, and the interesting thing, if you notice in verse 20, he said, if they don't wash, what, do my, what might my happen to them? They might die. Why would they die? Why would God kill them? For not being obedient, but not dealing with the sin issue, the sins, the contamination of sin that happens on a daily basis. Because folks, whether we realize it or not, God takes sin seriously. He desires righteous people, and He desires us to live holy lives, and He has m made means to do that. And if we fail to take part of those means, He says, I'm sorry, but you might die. Can you think of anything in the New Testament that would be parallel to that? that speaks to that issue? Well, the wages of sin, this is the, sin, the big sin issue. Oh, look, your, look in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 11. We'll be back here at Exodus in just a minute. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Does anybody know what 1 Corinthians 11 is about? Just off the top of your head. We read it every time we have communion. Or most every time we have communion. It's about examining yourself, but I want you to see something here. Um, verse 28, it says of 1 Corinthians 11, Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Verse 30, For this cause, for failing to to take this seriously, the matter of holiness. There are some who are weak and sickly among you. And what's the next word? And many what? Sleep. sleep. The word sleep means they died. You mean God kills people? Yes. Because He takes holiness seriously. And this is one of the reasons that we take the communion service seriously. And that's why he says to examine yourself. And because he tells these priests, you might die. In fact, on the Day of Atonement, when the high priest went, and this, we'll see this as we go forward, but he went into the Holy of Holies. They literally would tie a rope to him, to his leg. And he had bells on the skirts of his robe. And as long as they could hear the bells ringing, they knew that he was okay. But if the bell stopped ringing, they figured he got killed. And he, they'd pull him out with the rope. Because God takes, takes holiness very, very seriously. So, he says, these, these men are warned. He said, wash, wash, wash. And the interesting thing is, they were defiled while serving they weren't out in the world. They weren't going to the bars and, and, and to the prostitute joints. This is while they're in God's courtyard serving God. They got defiled and they had to be cleaned, cleansed. Do you get defiled in your day-to-day -day activities? If you get up and go out of your house, you do. <laughs> I mean... I'm not speaking to the fact that, you know, you went out and get drunk or something like that, but just living in this world, we get the, the, the junk, the, the dust, the, the dirt of this world gets on us. It's not purposeful. That's another thing that's interesting about this courtyard. The courtyard didn't have a floor to it. It was dirt. So, 
as they walked back and forth, guess what happened to their feet? They didn't have shoes on. They got dirty. And their hands got dirty. And so he says, when they go to this altar, or you go to this, this, uh, this labor, they have to wash their hands and they have to wash their feet. Well, why don't they just wash all over? Because they don't need to wash all over. They have already been washed all over when they were dedicated and consecrated as a priest. Now, I don't know about you, but that kind of reminds me of a story in the New Testament. John chapter 13. Let's look over there. Verse 1, now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world into the, unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And this is the Last Supper. Okay? We're all familiar with that. Supper being ended, the devil now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, and Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, he rises from the supper and laid aside his garments, and he took a towel, and he girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. I mean, we're familiar with this story, right? So, guess which one gave him problems? Simon Peter, verse 6. He comes to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? I remember one time we had some neighbors that went to, uh, years ago, to a Free Will Baptist church, and they were having revival, and they said, we want you and your wife to come go with us. And my wife says, I ain't going. And I said, why not? She says, they do that feet washing stuff. Ain't nobody washing my feet. <laughs> Jesus answered and said unto him, what I do thou knowest not, and thou shalt know hereafter. Then Peter says, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus said, if I don't, what? Yes, exactly. <laughs> he says, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Okay. So Peter, good old Peter, he doesn't just find a place in the middle. He goes from one side to the other, Right? So he says, all right, Lord, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head, give me a bath. And here's the point that I want you to see tonight. Jesus said, he that is washed needeth not to save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. What he was saying to Peter, and what the picture is here, is the fact, Peter, your sin has been dealt with or is going to be dealt with with the cross. He said, you don't need to be washed all over. You need to wash your feet. The, be, the idea of the feet is that as you walk through this world, you pick up the contamination of a sinful world. It's not the fact that you overtly, purposefully sin, but it just happens because you live in a sinful world. You don't need to wash all over. You just need to wash your feet. Let me wash your feet. And the same thing is true for these priests here uh, in this picture of this basin. He said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Yeah, because not all of them have. Judas wasn't saved. You're right. Um, so they have this picture here of these men being contaminated as they served. And they needed to keep clean. Because of that, there was a group of people called the Levites. And the purpose of the Levites, they were of the tribe, the descendants of the tribe of Levi, and their purpose was to take care of the tabernacle. They set it up, they took it down, they moved it, they carried the different parts, and part of their job was to keep this, this bowl of water, this basin, change because I'm going to tell you, it got dirty and it got bloody because this was a process, a big process, and they kept everything clean. Now, if you look back to Exodus and look at Exodus 38, 
And I want you to see something very interesting here because we're going to make an application here. 38 in verse number 8. Tell me what the labor, the, the basin was made out of. Bronze what? Mirrors. It was made out of brass mirrors because they didn't have glass mirrors. So they would take a piece of bronze and they would polish it and polish it and polish it to a fine finish. And these mirrors, of course, guess who they belonged to? The ladies. Come on, you guys know this. And remember when they left Egypt and God put it on the hearts of, of the Egyptians to, to give them things and to bless them. And, and, and apparently a lot of women gave up their mirrors. And it was out of this, these mirrors that the, the laver was made. The, the bronze was hammered together, melted, smelt, whatever they did, and shaped and polished. And it was believed that the bottom of this basin was very highly polished so that when the priest looked in to the water to get clean, that his reflection was there from the brass. And the idea was that they believe is that God was, was looking into the heart of the individual and saying, look, it's more than just outward. I care about what's inside of you. Now, here's the significance of that, if, I, if you will. If you go over uh, in the New Testament to... Uh, James chapter 1, what is the picture? James 1, um, 22. It says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like, uh, um, he is like unto a man, beholding his natural face in a glass, or mirror. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, not being a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. The picture here is that the Scripture, the Word of God, is like a mirror. Anybody ever been reading the Bible, and God spoke to you and say, that's you? That's the way God does it. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. That's illumination. He turns on the light of Scripture. He opens your eyes to see not just words on a page, but God's Word to you. It, he lets you see yourself. That's one of the, I, I'm going to tell you, this, I, that's one of the pitfalls of being a pastor. If you're serious about being a preacher of the Word of God, before I get to bring the Word to you, God works me over with it first. And so, th it's very interesting here that they just pictures this as, as a brass mirror, and the Word of God is a reflection of who we are. The Spirit of God takes the Word of God. That's how He cleanses us, by the way. Do you know that? Holy Spirit puts His finger on that spot. Say, wait a minute, don't go, for, don't go on anymore. Go back to that verse, because that's you. That's what you need to fix. It's, it reveals... It reveals who we are and what our need is, and it also cleanses us because it tells us what to do next. When it shows us our sin, what does it tell us to do next? 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Here's, here's the picture that I want you to take with you tonight. If you miss everything else that I've said, get this picture, okay? Because this is important. When you come in that gate, the gate of the court, the first thing you have to deal with is sin. There has to be an innocent substitute shed its blood to take away sin. For the, Egypt, for, for the Israelites... It was bullocks and, and sheep and, and doves and different things. But something innocent had to die for the guilty, and blood had to be shed. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Who was our substitute? 
Jesus Christ. Once and for all, He put His blood on the cross, shed His blood for us, and paid for our sins, and forgave us, and removed the condemnation of sin. Romans 8 says, For there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Once you go to that altar, they had to keep doing it over and over and over again. But when we come to the altar of the cross and we yet accept Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and trust in His work on the cross, our condemnation of sin is taken away forever. Amen, hallelujah. We don't ever have to worry about going to hell. But we still live in a sinful world and we still get contaminated by sin. This is where the labor comes in. This is our justification. The labor is our sanctification. This guarantees our position and our place in heaven. This enables us to walk holy before in a sinful world. That's why we encourage you, and Christine and I were talking about it before church tonight. She said, one of the things I like about this church, she says, you guys just go to Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. And the reason is, folks, because this is what matters, not me. If it's not the Word of God, then we're doing the wrong thing. And so he's saying, just like he told Peter, Peter, you don't need a bath. You've already, you have a, a standing that's righteous, but you just need to get your feet clean because they wore sandals and they had dirt roads. And, and if you folks ever grew up in the country and went out barefooted, you know that you came in at night, you had to wash your feet. This is our sanctification and it's progressive. They did this all day long. Here they are, they're working and they're offering a sacrifice. They go wash. They do offer the sacrifice, they come back and wash again. They, they get ready to go into the, the holy place to take care of the candle or the, or the showbread or whatever we'll look into as we go forward. They had to wash. Why did they have to keep washing? Because they kept getting defiled by the, the, the sin that was around them. While they were serving, they weren't out running around. They weren't out sleeping around. They were serving God, but they lived in a sinful world. And there's a picture here for all of us. As hard as you and I live, try to live for God and to be true to Him, we just get contaminated in this world. Sometimes it's unwilling and sometimes it's of our own will. What do we do? We look into the perfect law of liberty. And in that liberty, it shows us exactly where and what we need to do. And then it tells us what to do about it. It tells us how to come and be clean. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive. Oh, sure. Yes. They did. And we do it daily too. I hope you do it daily. I, I mean, and that's why we stay in the Word. I know. I know what you mean. But the thing was that once they offered that sacrifice for sin, they didn't have to go back and offer it again. They just had to go wash. And that's what I want you to see. There is the penalty of sin that's dealt with at the altar, but there is the practice of sin that's dealt with at the labor. What do we do? We get we come and wash. We say, God, I, I, I did this today. I, I'm in this situation now. I, I, I thought the wrong thing, said the wrong thing, acted the wrong way. Forgive me. He said, good. You just washed your feet. Let's go. But he cares about holiness. He cares about purity. Let's go and look at something else here. Um, Washing in this basin did three things for the priests, and it does three things for us. First of all, it, it made them fit for service. They couldn't keep serving unless they washed. The thing that amazes me is that folks can think somehow that they can live however they want to in this world just because they made a profession of faith and that they can do whatever they want to. God says no. 
if you're going to serve me, I want people, holy people to serve me. And how do you get holy? You get in the book. You keep, you keep that mirror before you and let God's Spirit open up your eyes and take care of it. So it made them fit for service. That was number one. Number two, it gave them the freedom to worship. They could keep worshiping and keep serving and, and, and enjoying God's presence and, and the honor of worshiping Him because they came clean. I wonder sometimes why folks don't get more out of a worship service is because they bring stuff in that they know they need to deal with and they don't ever deal with it. I mean, they deal with bitterness. They deal with sinful habits. They deal with lack of caring about God and His Word. And, and then they don't get anything out of, out of the worship service. It made them fit to worship and they made them, gave them fellowship with God. Um, look over at Hebrews chapter 10. This is something a lot of people, Christians, don't know. Did you know that you're a priest? Not a Jewish priest. Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, verse uh, number 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest. Now, how did they, um, how did the high priest get into the holiest? We haven't studied that yet, but remember there's two compartments. There's the holy place, which people went into, this priest went into every day. That's where the table of showbread is and the candelabra and all those things. But then there was the Holy of Holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant was, you know, the one that uh, Indiana Jones was looking for. And that, that only happened one time a year on the Day of Atonement. They would, bring the, they would bring the offering, the blood in, and it would be sprinkled on the mercy seat. So that's how they got in. They got in by blood, right? Only by the blood. No blood, they couldn't go in, they'd die. So look what he says here. Let's go back. Verse 19. He says, having therefore brethren boldness. Now he's speaking to believers. Boldness to enter into the holiest place. Well, how are we going to get into the holy, holiest place? We've got to have blood. He said, that's right. By the blood of who? Jesus Christ. And guess who he's talking to? You and me. He said, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Now remember, there was this big veil that hung between the two compartments, between the holy place and the holy of holies. And I don't know if you all were here, but Brother Jim Lesher preached a sermon back last year. He was filling in for me one Sunday and about that, that veil. I mean, and when Jesus died and, and his death was accepted as our substitute, the veil was what? Rent in two. Torn in two. And the way into the God's presence was made open for everyone who comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. We're priests. He said, a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart, washed in the blood of the Lamb, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Now, he's not talking about our physical bodies. He's talking about that we've been cleansed. We have a righteous standing through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, but when we come inside that place, He still wants us to come clean. And how do we get that way? Here it is. There's your basin right there. It'll show you what you need and it'll show you how to get clean. Because God cares about holiness. How do we draw near? With a true heart in full assurance having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. He goes on, and let us consider one another. 
Here's the verses that we always take, preachers take out and want to get people to go to church, right? We take those verses apart, but it all goes together. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another in so much the more as you see the day approaching. How do we, why is coming to church so big deal? Guess what we study at church? The Bible, the labor, this basin of the Holy Spirit's truth that shows you where you're contaminated and shows you how to get clean because God cares about holiness. You're safe. The altar has been taken care of. The blood of Christ paid for your sins. Past, present, and future. Your position, your standing with God never changes. But on the day-to-day process of living in this world, we get contaminated by sin. And that's why we need the sanctification. Sanctification is progressive. It is over a period of time making true in practice what is true in position, living out our faith. And how does he do it? He does it through the labor and by the Holy Spirit who wrote it to show us what we need and how to be what God wants us to be. All right, question. Anybody have a comment? Question? No? Okay. Next week, if you take your little sheet there with you and look, We're going to actually talk about the tent itself. Tent? I don't care about a tent. Did you know that part of the tent was made up of porpoise skins? Badger skins? All of them have a reason and a significance. So if you do your work and you do your homework, you'll be ahead and I'll let you teach next week. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I wish, I I pray, I pray before, I pray now that, that you'll, by your Holy Spirit, take these truths and make them real to, to these folks. Help them to see your plan's never changed. Your plan of redemption's not changed. Your plan of sanctification is not changed. You just have beautiful pictures in the Old Testament that point us to the reality of what you've done for us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Help us to take holy living seriously. Too many times it's, yeah, well, you know, I'm I'm saved. I I trusted Jesus. I'm going to heaven, and it doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters to you. It matters how your children live. They don't have to live that way to be your children. They're your children because you paid the price for them. But it does matter to you how we live. It matters to you how we behave. You're concerned about our holiness, our our, our life. And we live in a sinful world and sometimes we pick up the contamination just by living in this world. Sometimes our minds are affected by the, the, the world's thoughts and attitudes and, and priorities, and, and our lives are affected by the, the value systems of this world, and our relationships are affected by the false teaching of the God of this world, and we get contaminated. But you care that we're holy, and you give us your word, and your word points all this stuff out, and it shows it out to us, and it says this is This is what you need to clean, and then it helps us to be clean, to walk pleasing before you. And you do it all by grace, because we can't earn any of it, and we can't do it in ourselves. God, help us to walk holy before you. I pray a special prayer tonight for Holden and in the family, and I just pray, God, that I know your will will be done because you're God. But if it be your will, that this family won't have to go through this. That you'll touch that little body and has been through so much. I just commit him and I commit this 
officer who was injured, who's struggling with so much against him. And I pray for him and I ask you a special touch in his life as well. And for all other prayer requests tonight that came before us, I just thank you that you're a God that's in control. No matter what it looks like to us, you've got us. We give you our honor and our praise tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.